And we are live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the weekly Moto1.com test car happy hour. Today, I'm your host, because Seth is out, uh, and I'm here with senior editor Brett Evans and managing editor Brandon Turkus, and we're going to talk about some of the cars we're driving or recently drove. Um, I think I'm going to kick this one off because Brett... You drove, Brett and Brandon have both driven a car that we've talked about here before, so I'm going to just jump into a 2023 Nissan Z that I just handed the keys over to this morning, sadly. Um, the just new to be Z, clear, I, I have not driven it yet. Brandon has not driven the new Z. That's right. So it's me and Brett. Um, yeah, I really liked it. I mean, I was really excited to get this car um, after reading Brett's first drive and seeing all the stuff he really liked about it. I think off the bat, um, I think I'm going to say that it's the best looking car of the year in overall. Like it's my favorite looking car. I know that's a, an opinion to have, but I don't know. What do you guys think on style wise? There... But I definitely think it looks really good. Um, I, I love the, the way that they've taken it. So if you squint, you can definitely see that it's still based on the same platform as the old Z car, but they've really done an amazing job of making it look new and fresh and modern. Um, and I love those those uh, 300 ZX taillights. That that alone is a huge selling point in its favor. Yeah, I I, I, I like the exterior of it a lot. Um, I think it's going to stand out on the road. I love the classic ZQs. Um, it's good that Nissan kind of got back to that. My bigger concerns are in the cabin where the they weren't quite so able to hide uh, the very, very old, 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 old bones. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you've got you, you've got some new technology. There's, you know, a bigger touchscreen infotainment system, which I don't think the last one was even available with with an infotainment system like that. Um, yeah. But the. It, Again, I haven't driven it. I'm I'm worried about it feeling cramped because uh, the last Z felt very very cramped. I didn't love the seats on the last one. I'm worried, so I'm worried about that. Um, there's a lot of a lot of things about this car that have me concerned. Um, and I, I mean, I'm eager to drive it, but yeah. Well, I mean, before we go into the interior, because I do definitely have thoughts on the interior as well, and I'm not a short guy but i'm also not huge um and it definitely did feel odd but just on the exterior i mean it's it definitely has vibes of the old 350 and 370 right but remember when those cars came out i, I remember when the 370 came out and a friend of mine uh, bought one in high school and that was like the coolest car any of us had ever seen at the time right i think the styling when it came out Wait, was your so buddy good. had a 370 in high school yeah were his was... parents trying to kill him <laughs> probably that's a terrible car for high oh that is a I know. terrible car for a high schooler well you know what other car was popular in high school at my high school was the genesis coupe when that thing came out which is another oh, awful God, high schooler car. baby yeah i'm a baby but uh yeah I, I remember the styling and the shape of the 370 to be like amazing at the time so to your point brett i mean that it's definitely some carryover but i don't think it's like you know, egregious or anything. I think it, it fits the profile of the, the yeah. vehicle and all that stuff. So inside, man, it is rough because there's so much hard black plastic. The layout is basically the same. The, the new touchscreen is nice. The new digital instrument cluster is super nice. And then the seating position is just like completely out of whack for me. I was I felt like I was just sitting so high and so close to the steering wheel, like the steering wheel was almost touching my knees. Yeah. Um, I just couldn't get comfortable in it. But I mean, I'm looking at, about... sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm looking at that picture that, that Kyle, our producer threw up on, on here. And it, it, I'm struggling to like, I'm looking at it. I'm like, I, it feels like they, they stuck like a square peg in a round hole. Like it looks like those, those screens are just like attached to the hard points of the old Z's cabin. And it looks kind of like that. Maybe that's just not a great picture. Like I mean, not a great picture of the car, Jeff, you did You took a very nice picture. <laughs> um, I think it's just not a very flattering picture of the car. And those, I, those elements look really, really big and out of place. I think they did a pretty good job of actually updating the design of the old platform. You know, like you can see like very plainly in this photo, you can see those little vents on the, on the doors. 
That is straight. Yeah, those are straight from the old one. But, yeah. you know, like in person, I think they did a really good job of making it look modern and kind of kind of have slightly more, uh, you know, a little, little bit more feel like the, you know, the feel of the original and stuff like that. Like it, it, it's, I think they did a good job with the design. But like Jeff said, they just, they needed to invest probably 10% or 20% more than they did in materials quality. And then, you know, unfortunately, like those are the exact same 370Z seats with like ever so Those slight, were terrible. ever so slight, you know, adjustments. And so that means there's not really a lot in the way of bolstering. They're only height adjustable for the driver and not enough, you know, like I couldn't you, get, I couldn't get the seat low enough to be able to wear a helmet in the car. You want another thing that, that really drove me nuts about those seats in the 370. And I'm curious if they're, they're the same here. If you put the headrest all the way down and like push your head back against the headrest, you can feel the prongs kicking at your back. And it was in a lot of Nissans had this like it it was like a recurring thing in Nissan products for a long time. And it just felt so, so cheap and not nice. I don't remember that in the Z specifically. I know I felt it before in other Nissans, but I don't remember that in the Z. But, you know, it is it's just a shame that like, you know, Jeff was alluding to it. You just can't if you're if you're taller than, you know, taller than average, you can't quite get comfortable behind the wheel. It just feels everything just feels a little bit out of whack. It's weird. How... I mean, the, the windshield to me was really bad, like Camaro esque bad in terms of how narrow it was yeah. and how bad the visibility was, which meant I had to put my seating, like my seat at a really weird, like upright position. And then that's when my knees clashed with the steering wheel. But it was just, it was all out of whack. So how, how was because I'm looking at in this picture? How is the steering wheel? Because it looks it looks both oversized and too thin in this picture, like the um, rim is too thin. I kind of I kind it's of fine. prefer a thinner a thinner steering wheel to be honest. And I didn't feel like this was too thin um, or too thick. I think it was just like perfectly yeah. shaped. Right. Um, yeah, I didn't have a problem with the steering wheel at all. And I actually really like the the way they laid out those buttons. Um, yeah, it's really pretty seamless compared to some of the other steering wheel buttons I've, I've tested. So I it's didn't also, need it. Everything inside is pretty easy to use. Like the, the infotainment is pretty, it feels pretty, you know, intuitive, logical, however you want to describe it. The digital instrument cluster has tons of different modes. So like you can really have it set up for like, like, you know, minimalist, like just the information you need if you're driving down, you know, on a racetrack or whatever, but then you can also expand it to have all the gauges up and running. So, you know, they've, yeah they've done a good job with integration of those, of those bits for sure. Like, you know, it, it's surprisingly easy to live with, like in terms of just stuff being where you want it to be. So how does it actually drive Jeff? Like, so, I mean, t tell us about that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, just some specs really quick twin turbo V6, basically the same ones from the, uh, infinity red sports stuff, uh, 400 horsepower, six speed manual on this car, and then zero to 60 in about four and a half seconds. Um, it's quick. It's definitely a quick car. I mean, I think I sort of went into it expecting it to be, uh, I don't know, maybe slightly somewhere between like, you know, FRS, FRS, uh, GR86. I'm going way back okay. to FRS, GR86 and like Supra, like somewhere between there, closer to Supra. But it feels like it could, it could keep up with the Supra in a straight line for sure. Um, I really like the gearbox. I really like the six speed manual. It's nice and snappy. Uh, the clutch point isn't too like crazy tight, like in the, in the GR86. Um, so I, I liked it. Um, I didn't love it. I know Brett is going to disagree with me here on the engine, but it just felt kind of like, man, like a little bland. Yeah, I could not disagree. <laughs> could not disagree more. I, like it's, so the old the old VQ is like a that's a wonderful engine. It makes great torque. It's down a terrible, low. terrible, terrible engine. Okay, <laughs> it makes great torque. If down you low. like the VQ, yeah, that tells me all I need to know about it, this one. It's thrashy as hell, but it's like a very like baritone, mellow sounding. Like it's, I I love the VQ. So I was just I was worried that this was going to be uh, too much of a too like too much of a lane change, and then it surprised me. Like yes, it's completely different from the VQ. It's a lot smoother. Um, but it doesn't lose out on any of the loadout to work. And it kind of like has this like really like shrill, like ripsaw, like engine note that I just like could not get enough of. I thought it was so exciting to like row through the gears, 
redlining it the whole way. They let us do um, – when I, I did the first drive and they had us at uh, Las Vegas Motor Speedway and they let us do like, you know, zero to – it was like zero to 80 runs or something like that um, contrasted with the VQ. And it was just like, oh, it was so good. It was just so brilliant. I can't believe Jeff doesn't like the engine <laughs> as much. As, I, I, it blows my mind. I thought it was the best part of the car. Like I said, I don't hate it. It just doesn't feel like super exciting to me. And, and I say that just comparing it directly to the Super, I guess, because the, the BMW engines are just so much more entertaining to me. And I think that also goes for the suspension on this car. It's kind of like, it's not bad to drive by any means, but I think you'll have more fun in the Supra around town, even at low speeds than you will in this car. I think this car is probably better uh, in the canyons or more fun in the canyons. I mean, obviously I have no good roads here in Florida, but I had more fun with the Supra around town for the most part. You're, you're right about that would hold true in the canyons as well. You know, like I, my, my first day with the Supra, I took it out on a really tight winding road and it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. I mean, like that is such a, wonderfully polished like excellent sports car and i don't think you could ever in any respect say that the z is you know as good as as the supra it's not as polished it's not as fast you know before you could say that at least it had a manual transmission but now we're going to get a supra with a manual too so mm -hmm. you know you, you i don't think you can really make the compelling argument that the z is better but it also starts at ten thousand dollars less like you can get a uh, 400 is it 400 horsepower even jeff Oh, that's such a good angle. I'm sorry. I just yeah, 400 that. even. So you can get a 400 horsepower Z car for the same pro for less than a 280 something horsepower Supra, and that's yeah. that's really compelling. Like, you know, it's really hard to ignore ten thousand dollars of savings compared to a, a similarly spec Supra. It's. I mean, it's still not affordable. I guess this one, as tested, is fifty three grand. Yeah. Um, which makes it a little pricey, but yeah, to your point, you can get a base version for a lot cheaper than you can a Supra. And while it may not be like as fun, it's certainly really good in a lot of respects. And I think it makes for, for a super interesting sports car. So agreed. Yeah. So what's next you want to do? Uh, let's talk about BMW iX because I think Brandon has a lot of opinions on that. And I also have a lot of opinions having just driven it recently. So yeah, so I my my electric car binge continues. I don't think I've driven a combustion powered car in in over a month at this point. Um, I'm going to need to retoxify myself with a Hellcat at some point. <laughs> um, no, uh, I just got into the iX yesterday. That is a close approximation of what mine looks like. I don't have the the fun gold accents, um, but I just got into the iX. It's it's fantastic. Um, I, I, I've also driven the BMW i4 this month and I gotta say, I, I love the work that BMW is doing on EVs at the moment. Um, I, I think more than most any other automaker, they're really finding a way to balance the, the driving quality that you expect of a BMW with electrification, which can rob a lot of the character that you would normally have in a combustion powered car. Um, the, in the iX's case, I mean, and the i4's case, they both make they both make great sounds. Uh, they are wicked fast. <laughs> and this this thing, this is not even an M model, and it's I would say like 536 horsepower, um, zero to sixty in about four and a, four and a, four and a half seconds. I want to say, um, so super super quick for a big uh, five passenger SUV. Uh, it's it's great. It's a joy to drive. I'm I'm super excited to spend more time with it, uh, and it just kind of reinforces what what I I argued when I drove the iX M60 back in May, and it, and that was you don't need the M model. This this one is such a Goldilocks car. The ride is very pleasant. It still sounds good. It's still plenty quick. It has excellent range, uh, and you're not paying the extra twenty six grand that the the iX M60 demands. This one as test like loaded out. It's I think it's got every option, and it's one hundred and five thousand dollars. That's yeah, it's a lot of money, but honestly, it feels like a value. This this feels like a really great value in terms of how sporty it is. It feels about as sporty as a Cayenne, if I'm honest. Yeah, um, yeah I I sort of felt the same thing about the value proposition because it's like mine was about a hundred thousand dollars too, but it's you you're like okay, what am I gonna get rid of? 
basically nothing. I mean, I think right. for a hundred grand, this compared to a Model X or, you know, even like a fully loaded EQS or some or um, e-tron, like I, I don't, I can't see myself ever opting for those two over this thing. Yeah, it's it's really it's just so well executed in every way. And I mean, look, I I don't like the way that it looks from the outside. That grill is and the, so a few other exterior components are the only things I don't like about it. Everything else about this car, I'm 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 really deeply impressed by. I think the grill was the only issue for me. I like the rest of the design. I think it looks really good. Honestly, if mine weren't that adventure in red, um, if it were just like black, I and mm-hmm. could hide some of the the visual mass of that grill and like the stupid little floating roof thing <laughs> that they got going on. Yeah. Um, you know, those those are the two most offensive things about it. And you get this in in black, and it's going to hide a lot of that. Um, <laughs> yeah, the Iron Man spec that we're seeing right now. Um, but no, it's 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 just super well done. Um, and yeah, but actually what I did want to talk about the interior on this one, it is a all cloth interior with, uh, splashes of different textures. There's two different textures on the seats that are, it's done in a really neat, uh, there's like a slash pattern to it. The, if, if you go and look at my Twitter, it's, it's gotten a ton of engagement. It's at Brandon Turkus. There's, I posted a few pictures. It looks just, just brilliant. Um, the material choices are great. They're sustainable, uh, which is very, very good. And yeah, it's just, it's not something you expect. We've been so trained to think that, oh, luxury car, it's going to be wood and leather and carbon fiber. And this is just like, nope, I want warm materials. I want a little splash of wood, some crystals, some Alcantara. It's it's just so well done. I love the the cloth interiors on a lot of these luxury cars because I know Volvo was one of the first to really yeah. like do cloth interiors in a high end car. And I leather is uh, leather is fine, but I I really like some of the stuff that they're doing with like textiles and stuff like that. And I think uh, obviously you know for EVs, it's the you know environmental thing, the environmental aspect too, which is really nice. So i i agree i really like seeing some of these like high grade wool interiors that that some automakers are doing or even you know like um jaguar land rover is doing a really nice one right now yeah they do some really really great ones and you know this is a little bit off topic but even like some of the synthetics that that automakers are getting into like Mm -hmm. um you know mercedes has some some stuff coming down the pike where they mix um ground up like mycelium the stuff that grows mushrooms they mix that in with uh with like some some Finding agents and it makes like a really really convincing imitation of leather. So well, I mean, Brett, I mean, you yeah. you were in you were in the EQXX yeah. as well, and like that is like all sustainable materials, and yeah. it's one of the nicest cabins I've ever experienced. And like I, you know, that's a multi 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 million dollar concept car, but like it, it, it's so it's so exciting to see. And this is this is the kind of like car stuff I really like to nerd out on, like. Yeah to see how automakers are like kind of pushing sustainability and still maintaining luxury. It's, it's really fascinating to me. Yeah, for sure. So, but on the, on the old school luxury and leather and wood front, do we want to talk about the other car? Yeah, let's, let's jump into it because I think it's, uh, I guess it's similar to the I, the IX. Actually, it's more similar to like an X7. Right, but yeah, for sure. Yeah, the new the new 2023 Range Rover that Brett just had, first edition. Um, yeah, that is a that's like the perfect spec. That's basically the one I had too, and I I don't think I'd get it any other way. That I, is, in my opinion, probably the best car on sale right now. I, I would probably do the uh, the regular Atlas uh, inlays instead of the gloss black, but otherwise, I loved it. I thought it was so. I mean, I. I don't need to speak in past tense because I still have it in my driveway right now. And it's like, like I took a meeting from the back seat a couple of minutes ago because I just like, it was just, it's just a nice place to be. Uh, it's incredible. It's got a 4.4 liter V8 engine that like Range Rovers from a few decades ago is actually sourced from BMW. Uh, it's got a pair of exhaust driven superchargers, which is phenomenal. Just a absolutely stellar. Compressors. <laughs> Turbochargers, actually. Compressors. Um, and it's stellar. I mean, it, so it feels... Here's one thing that I will say about that particular engine. I think I would probably rather have the inline six because yes. 
um, the V8, um, it feels like a BMW. Like I can't, I can't get the throttle response the way I want it. If it's in eco mode, it's way too slow. If it's in normal or sport, it's like there's some turbo lag down low. And then all of a sudden you have all this power. So like I had a really hard time. I've had a really hard time kind of like pulling seamlessly away from stoplights. So I would definitely do the, uh, either the mild hybrid or the plug-in hybrid in line six. But yeah, that, I, man alive, that thing is so good. I I kind of felt the same way. I did the I did the first drive for this, and I drove both the V8 and the and the mild hybrid straight six. Um, and yeah, I think Brett is talking absolute sense. Like it it's it's it feels like a BMW in the best and worst possible ways. Um, but the the six is it's so silky smooth in the way it delivers its power and you just kind of waft about like it's, it's got a very Rolls Royce kind of feel to, to the entire experience. It's a very quiet engine. Um, and it saves you a hell of a lot of money because you can only get it on, I want to say the base model and the SE, whereas the V8 is only available on the autobiography in the first edition, I think. Well, to that end though, like you can get all the, we, I was playing around with the builder the other night and you can get, um, the the like executive package rear seats you can get that on the se model as an option with the and you actually end up getting the wool interior when you make that selection so like, there's there's really not a super great reason to go for the autobiography unless you're like in love with like the particular style of it i mean the se you can load out an se and it is going to be a fantastic vehicle yeah there is one reason to go for the autobiography it's to get those cool ceramic uh controls Did you oh, see yeah. those those are cool. Very pretty. Did, I love it. So you guys, you guys have both driven this now. Did you? Did you either? Were either of your seven seaters? No, uh, mine was a short wheelbase no. five seater. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. No, no. I was just gonna say that I didn't really. Well, this is bad, but I. They sent me. One that said it was long wheelbase, but I'm not 100 percent convinced it was long wheelbase. So that I is tried to that figure is, out the back seat, but is that yours? That. The picture right there. That's mine. That was the one that. That's I had. yours. So if it's long wheelbase, if it's uh, the four seat configuration. Yeah. So mine had the mine had the five seat configuration with that deployable center armrest. That so okay. that's actually going to be my one complaint. Um, in classic Range Rover style. Everything is electrically operated and everything is <laughs> slow and glitchy. So I, I, it took me probably five button presses to get the rear seat to actually do that. When in theory, you should be able to just hit max recline and it does it. And it would kind of like do it and then stop and then return to form. And then I'd have to hit it again and it would try again. So that's my one complaint about that car. It, I think that's a, a very valid complaint. Very worried about the long-term quality of some of those electric features. But other than that, it's, a, it's incredible. I, I got to get you guys. I got to get you guys into the seven seater because I was I was blown away at how good this thing is and how natural it looks with a longer wheelbase in this new body stock or in this new since it was redesigned. The old long wheelbase Range Rover always looked a bit awkward to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. This this one looks much more natural and the third seat third row seat is genuinely very usable. You could put two adults back there without much hesitation. It was. But they don't offer. Weird. They don't have captain's chairs, do they? It's got to be the rear bench. If you get the long wheelbase, you can get a true four seat configuration. Yeah. Okay. But that's with a giant center console, and you're talking, it's like a $180,000 Range Rover. Like it's, it's, I I rode in one from like, uh, from like Sonoma to San Francisco, and it was a, it's a very good way to get around, but um, not terribly practical and hilariously expensive. I honestly don't, I don't know that I would want the, I mean, unless I like really needed that like cachet of having a four seater with a full console, because this this like electrically deployable console thing was, I mean, aside from you know the long term quality concerns, it like it felt just as luxurious as a true four seater, and it as you can see, it had like it has like the deployable ottoman and the footrest coming off of the passenger seat, like it's everything about it just felt so premium and incredible. I I can't. I can't make a case myself for spending 180 grand on a true four seater. That's the thing. And I, I argued this in the first drive, like you can get a genuinely fantastic Range Rover that will just wow you every day for 125 grand. Yeah. Like you do not need to go crazy with the option sheet. Um, and I mean, it's, I love it that it, it's, if I, in my perfect two car garage, like for the last, 
you know, 15 years, a Range Rover has always been in there and that hasn't changed this time around. Yeah. I've, I've never really loved the Range Rover for whatever reason, the previous gens, it just kind of felt like a, a nice SUV, but not something I would could see myself owning, but the updates to this one, the new design, the new interior, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of moved over to like, I could see myself owning one of these. Um, but to your point, yeah, not at 180 grand. I think that the first edition, as cool as it is with the gold paint, um, I don't think it's totally necessary or brings enough to the table to where you like really want to upgrade to the first edition. So yeah, a nice, a nice SE spec, you know, loaded would be good. Well, the good thing is we don't have to worry about the first edition being around for too long. So yeah, <laughs> the other good thing is that we don't have to worry about what we would spend one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars on in real life. Speak for yourself, man. I'm winning yeah. the Mega Millions tonight. I'm going to be a billionaire when I wake up tomorrow morning. Yeah, um, Brandon's going to have three of these in his driveway by <laughs> next weekend. I'm going to have one I... for each day of the week. <laughs> so, Jeff, I have a question for you though, because um, I I've been inside a Cullinan. I haven't driven a Cullinan, and I know you have. Um, uh -huh. I was having a hard time just based on like the incredible interior quality of the first edition, especially with like the leather headliner and like the soft touch down the pillars and everything like that. I was kind of having a hard time justifying, you know, like theoretically justifying spending double the money on a colon. In. Do you think that is the Rolls Royce that much better or is it, are you just kind of paying for a badge? Um... I want to say, okay. and I need you to be impartial. I, really <laughs> love, the I, know I love, love the Cullinan. I would own five Cullinans if I could, um, but I don't think it is realistically that much better. It's definitely better. Like there's certain things that you you get in the Cullinan that you that don't even come close to the Range Rover. I think like the personalization like, is crazy. Yeah, like in terms of material choices and colors and things. The like materials. That. I mean, the materials you can get in the Cullinan are like unsurpassed like they're unbelievable but yeah if you just want a, a big luxury suv and you're like i don't want to pay double or triple for a cullinan then i think the range rover is a good uh alternative i guess but yeah i think i think like a, a good parallel like you can get a very very nice off the rack like suit like very very beautiful like nice materials beautiful craftsmanship and it's not going to hold a candle to something that is like custom tailored to you like on Savile Row in London. Like, that's really the difference. Mm -hmm. Like, only you are going to know that, like, exactly how much you spent and, like, exactly how this thing is custom made for you. And if you yeah. care about that, great, more power to you. I I don't personally understand anyone that would spend money on a Cullinan when the Range Rover is sitting right there. That's... I would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I do like how they took a page out of the Rolls Royce playbook by giving my Range Rover has uh, I don't know if yours did too. It has like the deployable picnic chairs on. The, yeah, that's on the, new uh, for this year. I like how they took a page out of the Cullinan's playbook with that in that respect. It's like, yeah, solid. Way to go. Way I mean, to go Rolls Royce elevating the Range Rover's game like that. Any <laughs> anyone that remember anyone that grew up watching like old episodes of Top Gear knows that like the Jeremy Clarkson argument on why the Range Rover is best is because it has a bench built into the back. Like that that's his that's his entire thing. Yeah. Well, we talked about our cars. So we got some good people tuning in from where's where's everyone tuning in from? We usually have some people chiming in. I see yeah, where's uh, our friends from so there's Lakeland some guy from Florida that usually Lakeland, shows up. Florida usually tunes in. Where's he? Yeah, yeah. Detroit Tiger Spring Training home. <laughs> um just, yeah, but yeah, thanks for tuning in. We got Michael Labriato. Who apparently is in Vice City. So good luck to you out there. Uh, thanks for tuning in, Shield. John Coates, I think you were talking about the Nissan Z when you said love it. And I completely agree. It's a wonderful car. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, early on, we had Babka Georgia throwing, uh, throwing some hieroglyphics at us. And we appreciate you. And happy Friday to the Jarmel on YouTube. Good having you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in again. We do this every Friday. Next week, we'll have some more fun stuff to talk about. Um, but yeah, that's it for us. Have a good weekend, everybody. Bye, guys.